multitude of nations, and I will make you an exceedingly what? Fruitful. Now see, that's, that's all through our New Testament, New Covenant, and fruitful is what we've been leaving out. We, you know, it says you're going to know false prophets and false teachers by their what? Fruit. Well, I'm going to tell you when you get through this week, I'm going to tell you what, you, your, your, your fruit inspecting is going to get a lot uh, more interesting. And I'll make you exceedingly fruitful, and I'll make a nation of you, and the king shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your what? Do you know that we're descendants of Abraham? He said, I'm going to establish this covenant that I'm making with you, with your descendants, which is us. After you throughout the generations for a what? It's an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your what? Descendants after you. Now look in verse 9. Now, I want you to watch this about the descendants in verse 9. God said further to Abraham, Abraham now, Now as for you, Abraham, you shall keep my covenant. Is that what he said? Now how do you keep a covenant? So just look at it and say, yeah, that's a covenant, God. And then go walk and be, uh, talk and act like Satan or whatever. He said, no, you're going, to, you're going to keep my covenant, Abraham. And he also said someone else is going to keep the covenant. Look at you and your what? How do you keep covenant? You keep covenant by walking in covenant. You and your descendants. We see a lot of things in the Word about being a doer of the Word and doing the will of God. All right, your descendants after you throughout their generation. Now, verse 11. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of covenant between me and you. Now, that was a sign of covenant then, and now today we are circumcised where? In our heart, right? And that's a sign of covenant for us today. Now, let's look in verse 21. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom, now it's not Sarah anymore, it's Sarah, whom Sarah will bear to you at this time season next year, and when he finished talking with him, God went, what's those two words? Where'd God go? Do you remember the, do you remember when the Lord came down? And he took on uh, kind of a flesh robe? Do you remember there might have been a covenant meal? And then it was Calvary? And then he what? Went up. Don't you remember that? Now, we won't be able to get to that until tomorrow night, but when you see these things, folks, well, it's going to change some things, change your life. But anyway, he went up. Have you marked went up yet? God went up from Abraham. Now, look in chapter 18, verse 1. Now, the Lord, have you, I want you to mark the Lord. The Lord is here with uh, two other men. Now the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. Now verse 4. Abraham says to him, Now you know, who do you think this Lord is? You think it might be Jesus? You know this whole word is a revelation of Jesus, don't you? Well, let's go ahead in verse 4. Please let a little water be brought and what? What do you want to do? I want to wash your feet and rest yourself on the tree. And then verse 5. And I'll bring a piece of bread that you may refresh yourself. And after that you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, so do as you've said. And then verse 8. And he took curds and milk and a calf which he'd prepared. He placed it before them. He was standing with them on the tree as they ate which I believe to be the covenant meal. Now, in verse 19, And the Lord said this about Abraham, now in verse 19, For I have what? Now, are you beginning to see that many are called, but few are what? Do you think that God... Might be a little particular who he's going to make covenant with. 
He said, I'll choose who I'm going to make covenant with. You know what he said? For I have chosen him in order that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord. Is that right? By doing what? Now this is what God told him then, and that's what he's saying right now, by doing righteousness and justice. Now you know what righteousness is? That's walking right in God's eyes, from doing things from God's point of view. That's a God kind of love. In order that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he's spoken about him, and he's going to give it all to him when he practices righteousness and justice. Now I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel 18. Boy, I tell you, it's going to get good. I mean, it just gets exciting. 1 Samuel 18. Sometimes I start in uh, chapter 17. This is where the army of the Philistines had gathered the army against Israel. Saul is king of Israel, and as they faced this Philistine army, Goliath, the giant who's over nine feet tall, comes out and wants to face one of the men of Israel, and they all were fearful. And uh, as you recall, David, the shepherd boy, appears on the scene, and he makes a remark that about this, this dog taunting the armies of the living God. See, David understood about covenant because what did God say about him? He's a man after my what? Heart. He, so David understood. And so David went out to do battle with this giant, and all he had was a slingshot. But he said, I'm coming out in the name of the Lord to do battle with him because he knew when he went out there that he had someone with him besides just a slingshot. And so he went out and he killed this giant, cut his head off. Isn't that good? And he did it all in the name of the Lord. And see, that's, 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 uh, that was, that's a covenant. But I want you to watch now after uh, uh, Jonathan, who is a son of Saul, who is a king, he saw David and saw these things happen to David, and he saw that David was going to become king of Israel. And a love came into Jonathan's heart for David. This was a mutual thing. And we're going to watch something happen to them in the very next chapter, in chapter 18. And let's begin in verse 1. This is, uh, David had just killed Goliath the giant. In verse 1, that came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan, will you please mark this when we come through, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the what? The soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. He loved David just like he loved himself. That, folks, when you get that kind of love, that's covenant love. All right, then, in verse 2, And Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. In other words, David stayed. Then Jonathan, in verse 3, made a what? He made a covenant. Now, what the... What, uh, proper translation is this. It's a blood covenant. He made a blood covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Are you seeing why he made the covenant? Because he loved him as himself. That's what covenant love is. And then I want you to watch the process begin right here of walking through the pieces. And we know they exchanged the armor. And any, any Hebrew, anyone that would read this word of God back through Bible days, understand everything that took place. It didn't have to go. They just see a little part of it. And you've just got part of it here and there and everything. Because in that day, they understood covenant, which has been a disadvantage of us because our traditions have, and the enemy has concealed it from us. But I want you to watch what happens there in verse 4. And Jonathan stripped himself of the what? robe that was on him. That was the first thing he did, and he gave it to who? He gave it to David. They exchanged robes, and then with this armor included, and here comes his weapon, the sword and the bow, and there's the girdle, his belt. Isn't that right? 
And so anyone, any Hebrew that ever read this would know, see this, see it already said they made covenant, but this is a process that when you come into a field and you have witnesses, so many witnesses, it's going to witness, and this process, like I was sharing with you, that, that uh, Peter and I would make in covenant before. Are you seeing this? This is, what, this is exactly what Abraham did with God. He made covenant. Now let's go on because, uh, uh, see, uh, God's hand was on David, and uh, this, this bothered Saul. Look in verse 7. And the women sang as they played and said, Paul had slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. See, Saul has only slain thousands. I want you to notice this very closely that David is ten thousands. And when you see a whole lot of jealousy involved, then you can know the demons are moving in. They are, they're already there, Okay. So you just watch right here in the end, verse 8. Then Saul became very what? He was very angry about this song. And for this saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, but to me they have ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul looked at David with what? Suspicion from that day on. And I want you to know that Saul's life took another change right here because the, the powers of darkness was already in Saul's life because God has already said, Sick Paul, sick Saul. On over there early. We'll get to it later on. But see, he already had a demon problem because he didn't, he didn't walk in covenant. And God had already said, Sick him. But see, he became very suspicious. He became some other things happened to him. He was angry. He had hate and murder. He had fear and dread and jealousy. All these things. This is all the works of the powers of darkness. Now, I want you to notice very carefully. Look at me. Everything that God has a real thing of in fruit, Satan has a counterfeit of. Are you going to remember that? So, there's godliness, and then there's iniquity. All right, now let's look there in the next verse, in verse 10. Now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit, what do you reckon that is? Now you know that's not the Holy Spirit, is it? Can I just go ahead and tell you, just write it up, just be real bold and put them up there, above it. An evil spirit from who? Where did this demon come from? What you, your Bible said it come from God? Boy, isn't it somehow he lost control of those things? Isn't it amazing? See, we, we always think, you know, Satan over here wants our vote, and God over here wants our vote. He hasn't got a vote. There's already a hell built for him, see. Judgment's already on him. Satan, or the demons, do not one thing out from control of God. And I want you to know when you line up with this word right here, the angels mighty in strength start rendering service to you and they're watching over this word performing. I want you to know they tear demons off. I asked a demon one day if I might just throw this in. I saw this demon all excited and, and so forth and, and began finding out what's wrong with him. And he said, there's a, I said, found out, asked him what's wrong and he said, the angel behind you. And, uh, I said, what do angels do to you? He said, they chase us with the word. <laughs> and I can see it. I got, I got a witness on it. <laughs> because it lined up with the word. But anyway, so the next day, see, here's all this anger. Here's all this suspicion, jealousy. And I want you to watch, when this comes in, when, when, when a person receives this into his life, he gets an agreement with Satan in the next cell, Next step, right here, God removes the hedge. Now, it came about on that day, verse 10, the next day, that an evil spirit from God came what? What's that word? Mightily upon Saul, and he raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand as usual, and a spear within Saul's hand. And we see in verse 11, he hurled the spear at David because now he had murder and everything. And his heart, he'd become David's enemy. Jonathan's father, Saul, had wanted to destroy David, hadn't he? Now turn with me to chapter 20, please. Chapter 20. Saul just has a lot of problems. He's, 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 God has already decided he's going to replace him with David. And it's up to David to just let God work all this out. See, David's not working it out. He's, 
kind of letting God work it out. That kind of sounds like a rest and covenant, doesn't it? Huh? See, he's already been anointed. Okay, in chapter 20, verse, Saul's trying to kill David, and then in verse 1, then David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin before your father? He's talking to Jonathan, and that he is seeking my life. And then you look in verse 8, and here, and this is what David said to Jonathan. Therefore he said, you know, uh, he said to Jonathan, Therefore deal, what's that word right there? Now sometimes it's called kindly or loving kindness. Let me just tell you right now, folks. Loving kindness is a covenant word. Loving kindness means a God kind of love. Loving kindness would be the love that Peter and I would have when, we became, when I was talking about that covenant, when we become one. It's a God kind of love when people become one. And that's what, frankly, that God's trying to bring us into, to a place like he did Abraham. Isn't that wonderful? And therefore deal kindly, I hope you have that marked, with your servant, for you have brought your servant into what? A covenant of the Lord with you. Now, this is what David said to Jonathan. But if there is iniquity, if they sin in me, put me to death yourself, Jonathan. For the, why then should you bring me to your father? And then I want you to look with me in verse 13. In 13, And Jonathan said, If it please my father to do you harm, may the Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also... If I do not make it known to you and send you away that you may go in safety and may the Lord be with you as he's been with my father. In other words, he said, I'm going to, if, if, if my father's trying to do this, he said, I'm going to send you away and I'll protect you just like, a, you know, that's covenant. We're one. Now watch what he says in verse, uh, uh, Jonathan speaking back to David in verse 14. And uh, John said, if I'm, I'm alive, will you not show me the what? I want you to remember that word, this loving kindness later in the New Testament is called mercy and grace. But through the old covenant, it's called loving kindness. That's a God kind of love. Show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die. And you shall not cut off your loving kindness. Jonathan saying, do not cut off. This is a God kind of love, covenant love from what? He's telling David, you'll not see. He already knew that David's going to be king. You don't cut off your loving kindness, this covenant from my house I'll hold forever. Is that what he's saying? Shake your head. All right, now. Not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So verse four, uh, 16, rather. So David made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. And Jonathan made, a day, uh, made David vow again. He made him say it one more time. Because of his love to him, because he had loved him as he loved his own life. And he made him vow that he'd never cut off his loving kindness from his house. That means uh, his offspring forever. So Jonathan checks on his father and he finds out he's still seeking to uh, kill David. And I'm not going to go through the whole sort of thing right here. But he has a deal where he's going to have this... Uh, boy to shoot an arrow in a certain place and that's going to be a signal to David that the father wants to kill him his father Saul wants to kill him and he's going to warn David to go ahead and flee which David does but they, they talk here for a moment before he leaves and uh, in, uh, we're still in 20 and let's look in verses uh, 41 41 uh, this lad was with Jonathan and he'd been shooting uh, he'd been picking up the arrows for Jonathan 41 and when the lad was gone David rose from the south side and fell on his face to the ground and he bowed three times and they kissed each other. I want you to please mark that. They kissed each other and wept together, but David more. Now, folks, see, because of our old perverted and worldly ways, thinking and everything, I think of the things that I went through to hug another man when I became, became a, a new Christian when I came to the Lord. And the things that we go through, 
perverted thoughts and let the enemy put this in their mind. Here, here, here are two men that love one another, that covenant love, they became one, that they kissed one another, and they wept together. And see, are you understanding the kind of love that the Lord is talking about us in cover love that he wants us to move into? See, we, we, we've, been, we've been over here looking at the wrong, wrong yardstick. Do you understand that when I become weak in my covenant, that all I have to do from a throne is say, Lord, your word says that when I'm weak, I become strong. I just quote the word, what he told me in his covenant. And now from your throne, Lord, I receive grace. And I stand in your word that I'm strengthened in all power by your might. And now in Jesus' name, I receive strength. And then when I'm weak, all of a sudden, and I've done it over and over and over and over again, when you get where you can't go, you just, you get to a place when you weak, you withdraw that strength and then there's a renewing and there's a strength that comes to you because of covenant. You have to be willing to let this love flow through you or it won't be coming to you from the throne of grace. So if you've got perverted thoughts, and put worldly ways about you, then you, and you, 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 you hold back a restraint of love, the kind of love and covenant love that the Lord wants us to have for one another. Are you beginning to see this? All right, now. I just want to, I just want to stop there just a minute because this is an example of covenant love. Verse 42. And Jonathan said to David, David, Go in safety inasmuch as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord will be between me and you and between my descendants and your descendants forever. Then he arose and departed while Jonathan went away into the city. Now I want you to watch and see what Saul, what's happened to Saul in the meantime all this. I want you to see how these powers of darkness, how these demons are just getting old Saul just down further and further and further. Uh, turn to chapter 22. Saul is just really having a case of self-pity here. He's really feeling sorry for himself. And, he, and he, he finds out about the covenant made between Jonathan and David. Jonathan is his son now, you remember. Now watch in verse 7, And, Jonathan, and Saul said to his servants, who stood around him. Here now, O Benjamites, will the son of Jesse also give to all of you fields and vineyards? Everyone's liking David. He's feeling sorry for himself. Jealous. Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? Verse 8. For all of you have conspired against me so that there is no one who discloses to me when my son has done what? Made a covenant. He's feeling sorry. He said, you, no one even told me that my son, see, that's a big thing, that my son had made covenant with uh, David, with the son of Jesse, and that's David, and there is none of you who is sorry for me. You don't even feel sorry for me. See, you see, it's pity party, or disclosed to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in ambush as it is this day. So, uh, I want you to turn over to 2 Samuel 3 with me. Because what happens in between right here, what happens next? If the Philistine army, they're in a battle and they kill Saul and they also kill Jonathan. And we're not going to look at that. But this would be a real interesting thing for you to read later on. But they kill Saul, who is king, and they kill Jonathan. Now Saul's son, Isbosheth, becomes king of Israel. And at the same time, David has become king of Judah. Now, I want, you, I want to say this again. Saul's son becomes king of Israel, but David becomes when Saul and Jonathan are, are killed by the Philistine army. David becomes king of Judah. Isbosheth, the son of Saul, becomes king of Israel. Now, Abner is the... Now, listen very closely to what I'm going to say. Abner is the head of the army of Israel under Saul's son. 
Joab is the head of the army under David. Now, there's a little civil war that takes place between them, between Judah and Israel. And in this situation, Joab's brother, now Joab, I want you to recall now, is with David. Abner is over with Saul's son in Israel. But Joab's brother gets killed by Abner in this little civil war that they had. So Joab really has resentment and revenge in his heart toward Abner. Now, in the meantime, Abner, becomes, who's head of the army of uh, Israel, becomes angry at the young king. He becomes angry at him. There's something he said, I won't go into detail, but he becomes angry at him. And then he sends a message to David. He says, David, if you'll make covenant with me, in other words, he's mad at the king, I'm going to bring all Israel over to you, and they'll be in your hands. I'll bring them over to you for covenant if you'll first make covenant with me. Now, I want you to watch him try to make this deal with David because he's angry at the king. So we see this. Uh, look in uh, verse 12. This is uh, 2 Samuel 3, verse 12. Then Abner sent messengers to David in his place, saying, Whose is the land? Make your what? He's telling David, Make your covenant with me, and behold, if you do this, my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel over to you. If you'll make your covenant with me, David, I'll bring all Israel over to you. And he, David, said, Good. I, Abner, I will make covenant with you. But, here's a condition. I demand one thing of you, namely, you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michelle, Saul's daughter, when you come to see me. In other words, come on, Abner. I'll make covenant with you, but you bring Michelle with you when you come. And so, there, Abner goes to make the meeting with him. And we see this. Over in 21, which obviously you see that he come there to make covenant with him. That's the whole purpose of what he just said. Isn't that right? He's coming in, and, and, and you can very well assume that covenant was made here in verse 21. And Abner said to David, Let me arise and go now and gather all Israel. That's what he already said, if you make covenant with me. And gather all Israel to my Lord the king, that they may now may come and make covenant with you. Because, see, he's made covenant with, with uh, David, Right? Are you following me? Shake your head. Okay. That they may come with you and that you may be king over all your soul desires. So David sent Abner away and he went in peace, didn't he? Now look with me in verse 24. Joab comes back. He's gone and he comes back and finds out what King David has done. Now I want you to get this picture. Joab is part of the kingdom of David, isn't he? I mean, anyone that David makes covenant with in this kingdom, he's automatically in covenant with them also. Isn't that right? That's really true. I mean, when he made covenant with uh, Abner right here, Joab was committed to this same thing as a part of Judah to be in covenant with him also. And here Joab is head of the army. But Joab comes back and finds out he's made covenant with a man who has killed his brother and he becomes angry about it. So watch him in verse 24. Then Joab came to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, he's talking to the king, Abner came to you. Why then have you sent him away? And he is already gone. Now verse 26, When Joab came out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the well of Sarah. But David did not know it. See, David didn't know he's doing all this thing. So he sent messengers out to bring uh, Abner back. So when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the middle of the gate, to speak with him privately, and there, what did he do? Watch what he did. He struck him in the belly so that he died on account of the blood of Ashel, his brother. See, because he killed him, he killed this man who had just made covenant, who had come there with David. Now, I want you to watch, and this is important for you to see, the reaction 
of David when he finds out about this and what he says. Now watch. Because, see, folks, let me just tell you, the blessings and the curses are here today right now. I know, watch. Verse 28. And afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are innocent before the Lord. See, this covenant was made before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. And now what he says, now here's who it's going to fall on right here in verse 25, 29. May it fall on the head of Joab. In other words, Joab is cursed. Do you see it? The curse falls on Joab. May this curse be on Joab. And on all his what? His father's house. And may, now watch that. May there not fail from the house of Job one who has a discharge. One who's going to carry out this thing to see that this discharge comes. Well, let's go on the next. Or who is a leper. Wonder who's going to carry all this out. Let's go on. Or who takes hold of a staff or falls by a sword or lacks, uh, lacks bread. See, that's the words that were spoken in the curse. And the curse, David said, I, I'm innocent of it. My kingdom's innocent of it. And this curse is on Job. Do you see this? This is what happens to people who are not working in, walking in covenant. Boy, when we get through tying some things together... I'm telling you what's the truth. Is so, and when you have understanding, you could just go run through the wall when you see this. I mean God something. So Joab is cursed for killing Abner. Joab broke the covenant the king had made, didn't he? All right, now I want you to turn to, with me to 2 Samuel 5. Second Samuel 5, verse 1. Now see, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron, and see, they're coming, what are they coming there for? They're coming to make covenant with David. Now they came and said, Behold, we are your what? Bone and we are your flesh. Now, isn't that an interesting thing to, for him to say right there? I believe that sounds just like, uh, you know, kind of what old uh, Adam said. Now, now, look at me just a second. Isn't that what Adam said when Eve was taken out of his side? You know, there's the first Adam, and then there's the second Adam, right? What the first Adam failed in, the second Adam succeeded in. Isn't that correct? But Eve was taken out of the side of Adam and they became one in covenant. See, a covenant was made between God and, and, and Adam. But there was a covenant between Adam and Eve and it became bone of my bone and flesh of his flesh. And she'll become called woman because she's taken out of my side. See, that's a covenant. That's a covenant term. Now, I want you to understand this. When the second Adam come... He has a bride, doesn't he? Also, right? And where is, she, where is the bride taken out of? Look at me. The bride is taken out of the side. Just like it's taken out of Adam. And they're one. Supposed to be one as it was in this. So you're talking about covenant terms right here when you're talking about uh, the bone and uh, bone of my bone and the flesh of his flesh. Now, Let's look at it again. In verse 1, Then all the tribes, it's all Israel. Now, who is the people of Israel today? Aren't we a people of Israel? The Israel is the ones that's in covenant with God. Are you seeing that? That's the people that's separated from the world into righteousness. They're holy people that are covenant people that God has chosen to be in covenant for himself. Are you seeing this, folks? All right, now. And all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. Now, David is about to become king of the whole business, and not only Judah, but also Israel and Judah also, see. So then you see in verse 3, so all the elders of Israel, now is there Israel today? And there's supposed to be elders in Israel. 
Uh, so all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron and King David and made a what? See, they made covenant with them before the Lord at Hebron and they anointed David king over Israel. Isn't that right? Now, during this time right here, do you see how these covenants is made over and over through the word? Now, we're coming to a place right here. A very significant thing happens. When Saul and, De uh, Saul and Jonathan, that's his son, are killed, Jonathan has a little son, he's called Mephibosheth. And the nurse hears about Saul the king and his father Jonathan being killed. And so immediately when a new king came in, what he did is wipe out and destroy all the other kings and says, see, there'd be no threat to him on the throne. You see? So immediately the nurse grabbed up Mephibosheth to take off with him to get him out of there because they know here's David's going to come. See, they've been lied to. They didn't understand. Because they figured David, is, you know, the whole bunch thought that he wanted to wipe out John, all ancestors of, uh, of Jonathan and all of Saul's ancestors. There'd be no threat to him on the throne. So they run, the nurse runs to take David, I mean take Mephibosheth out of the house and she trips and falls and he's crippled. And I want you to watch this in this verse in chapter 4, verse 4, okay? 2 Samuel 4. Now this is very important because if you recall when David made covenant with Jonathan, he made it to all his household. Is that correct? That was in the covenant. Now watch this in verse 4. Now the panic and everyone that believes in lies about David. Now Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was what? Here he is, he's crippled in his feet. He was five years old. He's only five years old when the report of Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. Uh, the report was that Saul and Jonathan had been, died, been killed. And this nurse then took him up and fled. And it happened that in a hurry to flee, he fell and he became lame and his name was Mephibosheth. And see, this little five-year-old boy is brought up in anger, bitterness, fearful, in hiding, hoping that someday, you know, that some way that he can take this on and thinking all the time that David wants to kill him. When all the time, remember, David and him are one, aren't they? So, I want you to turn with me right now to 2 Samuel 9. And this, it becomes very interesting right here. Now here, David is. He's probably eating there one day. And he looks down. You know, he's uh, having them pass over something to him at the table. And he looks down maybe at his, this covenant mark right there. And he sees this covenant mark that he had made with uh, Jonathan. And in his mind, he thinks, you know, I've uh, made this covenant with the whole household of Jonathan. I just wonder if there might be any descendants anywhere left of Jonathan because I have to keep covenant. I have, you know, that's, uh, that's what the blessings and promises were. So we begin there in verse 1. And we watch what David says after he remembers this covenant with Jonathan's household. Verse 1, Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now see that, what kind of, have you marked kindness right there? You know what that is? That's loving kindness. That's a God kind of love for Jonathan's sake because he made the covenant with Jonathan if there's anyone in his household, he wants to show this God kind of love to him because he has made covenant with Jonathan. Is that right? It's Jonathan's sake that he's doing it. Amen? Amen. Now you're starting to see whose sake. Yeah, let me just tell you. What, what, you go ahead and tell you. I think it's important to tell you right now. This Mephibosheth is a type of us. King David is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as he's coming to make covenant with the king, it's a type of us. Lame, crippled, and I want to tell you what, folks. People a lot more crippled than you realize they are. They're coming to the king 
See, God has his covenant with the king. You understand what I mean? All right, in this case, King David had his covenant with Jonathan, who's his son. Now, I want you to watch, and you're going to see this important thing, because tomorrow night, we're going, when we come in the first thing, we're going to get through this thing of covenant, and then we're going to see how the powers of darkness has perverted all this thing, and you're going to have an understanding of where you are. And I'm going to tell you something, folks, that uh, uh, many of you have already learned some of these things, but I'm going to tell you how authority you don't have to go get some man. I'm telling you all you have to do in the name of Jesus. When you have, but first, you've got to have understanding. And, and it's very essential that you have understanding of covenant. Now, he's going to show the loving kindness of Jonathan's household, and he's asking uh, uh, one of it, Jonathan's servants if there's any, any of them left. Now, verse 2. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. Verse 3. And the king said, Is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the what? Don't you forget that, because later on over in the New Testament, this becomes mercy and grace. This is loving kindness. This is a God kind of love that he wants to know, Is anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of who? There is still one left. There is a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet. Now, so the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel of Lodabar. In other words, he's in the desert and he's in a parched land. He's just removed from everything. And see, that's a type of us in a desert, parched land. Do you see that? This is where we are. I'm telling you that downtown Titusville here is a wilderness. Now, see, if, if you don't see that, then you're, you're, you're deceived. You're deceived. Your, your heart's going after the world. Well, let's, let's skip on down. Well, David, see, David wants to show loving kindness, God's kind of kindness to jo Jonathan's household, isn't he? So Mephibosheth, now he's afraid of David, and if we just put ourselves in Mephibosheth's place, Mephibosheth has been hiding for David, and he's resentful, bitter, and fearful, living in Lodabar, the desert place. And then, you know, the king sends after him, and then he hears this knock on the door, and it's just a short time later, you know, here they've got him, and he's taken him and placed him before the king, and you know what he's, what he's looking for. He knew he was fixing to be ordered to be killed, because that's what he's been told since he's five years old. Are you seeing that? He's fixing to be destroyed. He's fixing to, be, he's fixing to hear these words. He's going to be that David would kill him. And see, he's been living with these lies for a long time. All right, now let's, let's start in verse 6. And Mephibosheth, if you care to make yourself a note right there, Mephibosheth means a despised thing. That's the meaning of this name here, despised thing. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face, prostrated himself, and David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, Here is your servant. Now he's expecting to hear the words off with his head. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I'll surely show what? There's that God kind of love, the kindness to you for the sake of who? Your father Jonathan, who I made the covenant with, and I'll restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, and you're going to eat regular at my table, the king's table. Now, isn't that interesting right there? Mephibosheth, you've just been living in fear and ignorance of me, and I've just been waiting for you to just give you everything you've lost. It's all yours. Mephibosheth can't hardly believe his ears. Mephibosheth, I'm just doing this because of the covenant that was uh, cut before you were born. And this is the kindness that God has, Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth, you know, he's overcome, isn't he? All right, now let's look in verse 8 and see, are you seeing again that this is a type of us before King Jesus? Is that right? Are you seeing this? All right, now in verse 8. Again, he, you know, the bitterness and hatred and everything. And see, you see him in a very humbled right here. God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. And here's, he's humble for the other king. David, and in verse 8, again, he prostrated himself, and he said, What is your servant like you should regard a dead dog like me? He can't hardly believe what he's saying. He's going here, he's going to eat at the king tables. He was expecting to be killed and destroyed right there, and he can't, he, he can't hardly believe what he's hearing, and, and he's going to live in a palace. 
and eat at the king's table. So what do you regard a dead dog like me? Are you understanding that anyone who is not in covenant with God Almighty are dead even while they breathe and walk in God's eyes? Do you realize that? Well, let's look there. In verse 9, Then the king called Saul's servant, Ziba, and said to him, All that belongs to Saul and all of his household I have given to your master's grandson, and you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him, and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson shall eat at my table regularly. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Look, all, look at all the things that's just given right over to Mephibosheth when he'd living in a parched land. Are you understanding that's where we are? Do you understand that this is what God is wanting to give us? Do you understand that you have a child in rebellion, you can have your closet full of gifts and, and everything that you want to give to him? You know, you don't, you don't go, you go reward one of your children for rebellion, do you? No, you don't open that closet up when he's got his fist in your face or sticking his tongue out or whatever. And see, these are all the things that God wants to do for us. And there's an enemy that deceives us and has deceived us. All right, now let's go in and read verse 11. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth, the despised one, ate at David's table as one of the what? As one of the what? He has became one of the king's sons. So Mephibosheth, now he's dining at the king's table. He knows he does not deserve it. He knows he's there because of those covenant marks. He's looking right across the table right there, and he's seeing those covenant marks. He knows he's there because of that covenant. Are you understanding grace? Are you understanding loving kindness, folks? Are you understanding mercy? Are you understanding the lies that we receive in our mind about these things? So you see, because the covenant, this covenant was made before Mephibosheth was even born. And he's here, and I'm here, so he just has to think, I'm here because of the kindness of God. It's a God kind of love. And understanding the covenant is understanding the principle of grace, isn't it? See, co the covenant doesn't depend on our feelings or emotions. Are you seeing that? It's a rest, folks. It's not works. It's something that you get in on. I want you to understand that the devil, the powers of darkness, and everything in this world is not out from under the control of God. But it's out of your control if you're not in covenant walking with Jesus. You're deceived. And God lets the people believe a lie and be deceived forever because they choose not with all their heart, body, soul, and heart to come to the one who made them. They want to be like Satan, wise in their own eyes. But anyway, see, the people today have a wrong concept of God. Don't you believe so? Who do you think is trying to give us a wrong concept of God? That he's there ready to zap someone out. It's what he's there ready for. He's wanting the God kind of love to show to us, just like you saw in Mephibosheth. Yeah. See, they don't know who, we just don't know, we just haven't known who God is. So then... Where the first Adam fell, we look at, and there became the curse. To you and me, every one of you, each one here, and to me and Zlacus, because of what the first, second Adam failed to do. And we're going to look at that. Now, when you have understanding about this, see, now this is just the first day. And when you have understanding about this, you're going to see how you walk right over the top of the powers of darkness. And there's only one way you do it, and if you don't do it this way, the way of this word right here, you will believe that bitter is sweet. You will believe that darkness is light unless you have the understanding and wisdom of God because let me tell you what you are. You're exactly what the Bible in Jeremiah 10, 14 says you are. You are stupid and devoid of knowledge. And there'll be times this week, and we're going to have a good time, 
There'll be times this week that you'll begin laughing. You know, when we put some things together, we laugh at ourselves. you know, when we make mistakes and things like this. But what we're really laughing at is the fact that how to see, because I'm going to tell you something, folks. The powers of darkness work people who do not walk in covenant. You do not know the way. That is the only way. And they work people just like they do puppets. And you'll laugh at some of the things that you see that the powers of darkness have been doing, but you're laughing because really what this is indicating that we're just like the Bible says we are and the whole world is stupid and devoid of knowledge that do not come to receive the wisdom of the Lord. Now, when you have understanding about that, which you can only have it in one way, that's the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And you're receiving it from God. And then you walk in it. And I want to tell you, folks, this is a new day and it's a new time because it's dark and it's been pitch black. That's why we've been sitting around counting each other. I mean, you've got to do something. If God's not, you've got to get excited about something. Just count everything that moves. <laughs> I want to tell you God is something. I want to tell you he's something. And I want you to know it's divine appointment that me, it's divine appointment that you. Folks, don't you never ever think that you figure out anything about God or anything about this word of God. That's a deception. That's a lie. Now, the devil watch you receive things from the Lord. When you drive down the road, don't you ever think in your car that you ever figure out anything? It's the Spirit of God. It's all revelation. Now, let me, I want you to understand something about you and your part. This revelation doesn't come to the ones that God has blessed, necessary, not them only, the ones he's blessed with the most intellect. It's obvious that God has blessed some with more intellect than he has other. Now, in the world, it's programmed to look up to the man, to the intellectual mind. See, that, uh, Satan likes that because he can just work them all over the place and, and doing it. He's doing it to the whole world. But in the world, you look up to intellect and the man with the money gets the floor. Isn't that right? Amen. All right, now when you bring this into the church, you can be intimidated by a tither. It's a big, big, uh, uh, a big tither that's a tire, you know. He can just intimidate and run a thing. You just get everything just revolving around $100 bills and everything and you know, and then the enemy can use that thing to intimidate, you know, to, to put people away from the Lord, to get them away from the Word. There's a lot of deception, and boy, I tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to be, where I wish, I'd like to start on the Friday. I wish I'd come here and just could have started on the Friday part. Because I'm going to tell you something that's going to happen to you folks. As you sit there in your seats right here, the Word of God, when you know the truth, the truth setting you free. Once you've ever been lied to about something, somebody ever tells you a lie, you don't, you don't look up to people to tell you lies, do you? You've been lied to by the powers of darkness. And there, we're going to come, become dormant in your life because once you know the truth, the lies won't work anymore, see? And you're going to, you're going to notice each night that we go by a freedom, and particularly when you get back home, you just got a freedom. You're just freer, and you're freer, and you're, as you're sitting right here, and don't ask me to explain it because I mean God just does it. And you're going to know that it's just the Word of God and He's just been doing it and I've been getting in on it and I hope you do too. And He does it with His Word because it's what God is doing in His grace and I don't know what all He's doing. I've just got a part. You've got a part. It's all Jesus, and your part is just as important as my part. You remember that. Don't you never think there's a big Jesus in someone, and you've got a little Jesus. That's a devil. It's all Jesus. The same Jesus in Paul's in you. You, you understand that? And I want you to let everything ever tell you in your mind that you, can't, that you can't learn, because I want to tell you something. God's revelation is whosoever will. And it's all a heart toward the Lord. It's not a head. It's not, see, that's the world out there, head knowledge. This is spiritual. The natural mind understands not the things of God. It's spiritually discerned. It's all grace. It's all loving kindness. It's all mercy. And it comes from God. And God's just been wanting to dish it out to a people who would just receive it and let God be God. God just wants to be God. You can't hardly blame him, can you? Now, he's smart. He really is. 
He's already got the plan. And Jeremiah said that, you know, it's just like a horse charging into battle. And I think that's the way we've been. You know, we get a little truth and we're going to take it and just run about 50 miles ahead of God all the time. And God just, just, just watches and just shakes his head. You know, it's a bunch of folks just run in the walls. And we're going to boast in the Lord. These one-man band days are over, folks. And, and I'm telling you, I hope it's over for, for pastors who are waiting tables. See, they inherit this. And you love the Lord with all their heart and they move right into position of tradition. It's not a thing where a body, a bunch of people come together and their hearts go and live after the world. It's a body ministry, folks. The shepherd is just part of the body. See, that's one of those hand-me-downs from the Catholic and the priest days where they control things. You know, the priest has the word. You know, he's got all the word. You can't have it, you know. You've got to go to the priest and find out what the word is, see. So that all that hand me down in these traditions and everything, and you get your Bible, you repent and get your heart right with God, and I'm going to tell you what, that this Bible is made for you to read. He'll teach you to read if you can't read. He did me. I couldn't even carry on a current conversation. I absolutely could not carry on a conversation with anyone the first three years I was saved. Isn't that right, Pharaoh? I absolutely, that's pitiful. The only time I could ever talk is when I was witnessing and the Spirit of God would kind of take over. I just loved to hear myself talk then because I couldn't talk no other time. <laughs> that's the reason I like to witness all the time, tell people about Jesus. Because the only time, because there's much brain damage. And I, I admit, see, we're not in the image building, but we're in a Jesus image building business right here because of the drugs in my life. It's pitiful. See, I was so demonized, I couldn't even get out of high school. I couldn't even study. I couldn't even concentrate. And see, I didn't think Jesus could help me. There's no one told me that Jesus could help me, but he did. And I'm seeing Jesus help people by the hundreds. And he's doing it with this word. See, I don't spend a lot of time praying for people because the world is so, I mean, we, we're so fleshy and everything in the church. We see God doing something to the man. We're going under the, under the man. We're going to rub up against him like something's going to rub up on us. So God has led me in a thing, you know, just, and I'll tell you something now. As you come along, you're going to get light and, about things. You're going to see things about yourself. Don't be alarmed about it. Uh, the things about your family and everything, what you concentrate on is you being right before the Lord because Friday and Saturday... I don't know which day or thing we're going to pray, and I'm going to tell you, folks, it's going to be glorious. We're simply all going before the throne of grace as you sit and stand right there in your seats, folks, God Almighty, from his throne of grace. It's going to bring a freedom to most of you that you've never known in your life. If you'll deal with any unforgiveness, the Lord's not going to forgive you. He's not going to do nothing for you if you have all your unforgiveness towards someone else. If you don't deal and have your life and everything and repentance and everything before the Lord, right? So you just block him. You're not in agreement with the Lord. But as you stand here, and it won't be any, I'm going to tell you what, you're going to stand right there, and I'm going to tell you that the biggest part of you will just get lightheaded. Listen to me. You will absolutely get lightheaded because of all the pressure that the Lord is going to take off of you sitting. Is that, is that, is that all right? And then you're going to know. <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you something. Well, you just bear with me a couple of days here and we'll just get to flowing. It's going to just be so exciting and so good. And I want you to know that you'll agree with me one thing before this week is over. That it's a divine appointment that we've been together this week in the name of the precious Lord Jesus Christ. Watch your thoughts and guard your thoughts. You don't get out of the war and you walk out of here because the enemy knows what's going to take place this week. And I always watch the Lord do it over and over and over again. And I just stand in the ladies and never know exactly how he's going to do it. But I watch him always do it. And as long as my motives are right in my heart and your motives are right in heart, God just works and it's all grace. Just like old Mephibosheth. And when you come back tomorrow, I want you to show you how our covenant 
with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to get right into that thing, and then we're going to look at the powers of darkness, and we're going to see what they're going to be exposed, or what they've been doing, what they've been telling us, and how they've been controlling us, and deceiving us, and keeping us from this covenant right here. And this is going to be a different day, and a different walk for you. Amen? You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, Brother Peter? You have a word? <laughs> that's right, and that's a good word. Let's just sing one, one song. I want you to stand up and let's just sing. Uh, let's just sing, You Are Lord. Let's just sing it to the Lord. We just close your eyes? Now, don't know anyone leave here. I want you just to close your eyes now and just put your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, and let's just love him now and just say, You You are There's a difference in waking up in the morning and having the Lord talking to you instead of the enemy, isn't it? Now, how many of this morning when you woke up had scripture, woke up with scripture going through your mind? Hold up your hand. All right. Now, I'm going to pray that tomorrow morning, every one of you will. You're going to wake up with scripture. God's word is going to be going through your mind in the morning. And we're going to start saying this word again tonight. Will you stand back up again, please? And let's just, let's just... And this is a word that you're going to hear when you wake up in the morning. Because this is when the, uni the enemy usually starts your day off when you first wake up in the morning with negatives. Do you ever notice how easy it is to keep your mind full of what's wrong? You know, it's a little difficult to keep your mind on what Jesus is saying. So this can be a routine that can never be broken if you'll hold fast to this word and quote the word. Now, when we hold up our hands tomorrow night, you're going to look across and you're going to see because this is what we're going to ask the Lord to do. Now, Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray in the name of Jesus that when these people wake up in the morning, that your word will be going through their mind. These words that we're going to be speaking right now will be going through their mind in the morning. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Blessed with all spiritual blessings. In the heavenly places. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. As Jesus Christ is in the world, so am I. I am born again. I'm kept by the power of God. I'm redeemed by the blood. I'm born again by the Word of God. I'm complete in Jesus. My sins are nailed to the cross. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Will that be a good sound to wake up to in the morning? Amen. I rule and reign in the name of Jesus. I rule and reign I'm more than a cockwer. I'm more than I, I take dominion. God is my heavenly Father. God is my heavenly Father. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Jesus Christ is my Lord. And I'm a product of His love. And I'm a product of His love. I have love. I have joy. I have peace. I have long-suffering. 
I have goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm strengthened in all power by His glorious might. All things are under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's been given to be the head of all things. To the church, which is us, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Our weapons are mighty in God to tearing down these strongholds, casting down imaginations, speculations, all thoughts that exalt themselves against the Word of God. And I bring all thoughts captive to the obedience of this Word. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has already appeared for this reason to destroy the works of the devil. He disarmed him. He made a public display of him. And he's given me authority in his covenant word, with this word, and in his name, that I have power over all, 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 all the power of the enemy. In the name of Jesus. And so I always triumph in the name of Jesus. And this word never returns void. And this word never returns void. And in Jesus' name, and in Jesus name I, come before the throne of grace, I come before the throne of grace. And now I receive grace. The word in the blood. And I now remove from me. And this place. All the works of oppression. I remove all heaviness in Jesus' name. I remove all the works of pain and headache. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your word is life to us. And health to all our whole flesh. I remove in the name of Jesus all the works of doubt, unbelief, legalism, and traditions. In the name of Jesus. I remove in the name of Jesus all the works of tiredness, works of tiredness fatigue, fatigue ex exhaustion, exhaustion, and sleepiness. And sleepiness. In, the In the name of Jesus. We're not going to have any going to sleep tonight. <laughs> so now in the name of Jesus, from your throne, Lord, we receive the finished works of Calvary, we the works of Calvary. and we proclaim now in Jesus' name, Liberty and freedom, Liberty and freedom. In, the in the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. We, speak peace. we speak peace. Now that's how you're going to wake up tomorrow morning in Jesus' name. Will that be all right? Well, amen. We be seated. <laughs> now, now you've either heard something or you've got a lot of confidence. They can be hands laid up all over this place because that's the way the Lord Jesus is going to wake you up in the morning. Now, you have to, here's what you need to learn, is to take thoughts captive. When a dart comes in there about something that you're interested in, you just put that dart out, that missile, you just hold the shield of faith up there and, and let that word keep continue coming until it's time to think about that. It's time to receive the word, to think about Jesus. It's a, a lot of people go to bed and they began planning the next day. You don't go to bed to work. You go to bed to sleep, don't you? It's the devil that wants you to go to bed to work. A lot of people don't know that. You have your best ideas and plans. You just go to bed and put your notepad out there and start planning out your day tomorrow. The best way is just to have the Word of God before you go to bed at night. Go to sleep with the Word of God and have the Word of God on your mind. And what a difference it'll make in your life. Now, we're still talking about covenant, folks. Isn't it precious? 
Did the Lord give you some light and understanding? We have talked about, you know, there was a covenant that God had with Adam. There's a covenant he had with Abraham. He had with Noah. Uh, we have looked at this covenant with uh, uh, making covenant with Abraham. We've looked at the covenant he made with David and Jonathan. And uh, we also looked at uh, Jonathan's uh, son, Mephibosheth. And we saw that very clearly and plainly how that is a type of us as dead dogs, lame and crippled, coming to dine at the king's table. Now that's really what we're doing right now. Is that right? You know, they talk about the marriage supper of the Lamb, and, uh, you know, people, you know, we who walk in the spiritual realm, you know, what we live off of, we live off of every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We live off of this bread right here, you see? And so the, the world out there, they live for their cartons. All their decision, every decision they make in the world out there is based on pleasing their carton. In other words, they live to eat. The soup line bread. They live to eat. Now, see, we live off this. There's a difference in living to eat and eating to live. And we just eat to live because here's where we're living off of every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It's another dimension. We have uh, old things have passed away. All things have become new, new. We're not conformed to the world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. We walk in the spiritual realm. We walk in the flesh, but we do not walk after the flesh. Amen? And so now we have come to the place of understanding our covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to get, get into that tonight. And then tomorrow is where I have usually started seminars before. Up until here recently, and uh, this is kind of new, kind of uh, going through the covenant. And the Lord just changed this for me recently. But I'm real familiar with the material I use after tonight. But this has been new. But there is a war against you and a war against the covenant, which we'll begin looking at uh, maybe even later tonight or first thing tomorrow. And uh, to show the deception and, and expose the enemy, how he has deceived us, how he has deceived our ancestors from knowing the truth and not knowing the truth has prevented us from being free. Now, you remember that uh, Brother Peter Lord and myself, I explained the steps of covenant that we would make and we compared this with the covenant that's in the Word. And now I want to relate to you some uh, steps of covenant that we make with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that has the covenant with God. And we come into covenant with God Almighty. You know, it's a different thing. Uh, for man to make covenant with man is one thing, but for man to make covenant with God Almighty is entirely something else. There are some conditions involved. And God says, I will if you will. And that's what this Bible is all about. It's about covenant. And so the first things that we do with the Lord Jesus Christ, we exchange robes. And we know that Jesus laid aside his deity. He put on the flesh being made in the likeness of man. He came to be like one of us. And he put on the flesh. We, uh, the scripture for that, and this is on the notes, and I hope that everyone, uh, has everyone here got these uh, uh, list of scriptures that, uh, uh, raise your hand there, we'll pass these out if you haven't got them. All right, just leave your hands up and I'm just going to continue right here. Because see, this is the only material you get here. If you don't read your Bible, you won't, you, we don't, we'll leave your comments out of it. You just have to let the Holy Ghost tell you what he wants to about this word. So anyway, the steps of making covenant would be exchanging the robes. And we know in Philipp, uh, Philippians, we won't turn there, but it's in verses 5 through 8, which is on your list right there, that Jesus emptied himself and he took on humanity. Now we, in turn, I guess I better wait a minute because I don't want you to miss this. Now, it's not necessary that you, uh, in some cases, that you, that you absolutely follow along with that list and everything. I just want to make sure you have it right now because, see, you and the Lord, I'm going to tell you what. What I'm sharing right now, now listen very closely, is going to be a lot more interesting to you toward the end of the week than you have any idea of. 
And so you're going to want to get with the Lord, you and the Lord, and see how, as you go back over these scripture and these, this word is going to come years. It's going to become years. Now, so Jesus put on, took on the flesh, a robe of flesh, and what do we take on in this covenant? We take on the spiritual. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and of course there was a death to Jesus to come into this covenant. See, now many are called and few are chosen, and he's choosing us for covenant with him. But here there is death involved in our making covenant. Every time you make covenant and you become one to someone, it involves death. When I talk with Brother Peter and I making covenant, I want you to know that was death to Peter. That was death to me. Don't make any big thing out of this because that's absolutely what covenant is. And that is what you do when you take an oath to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. You take an oath to walk in covenant. All right, now, the scripture, well, we won't turn to it, but it's in Romans 13, that we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and here is the death that we make no provision, no provision, not any, for the lust of the carton, the flesh. Not any, because I'm going to tell you why. Let me just go ahead and tell you right now. This carton is in total agreement with Satan, the nature of it, the nature of it. The carton, we're beautifully made as far as the flesh and the carton is concerned. But I want to tell you that the nature of this carton is of Satan. And it's in total agreement. This carton likes to hear from demons. It loves to hear. It's in agreement with it. Because the demons always come to tell this carton how to walk over the whole bunch and how to get to the top, how to be self-centered, selfish, and take an advantage in every opportunity that you have. That's how the whole world are puppets right now. The whole entire world, I don't care whether they're dancing on one foot, ha, 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 or living in a penthouse, they're slaves of demons. And we will see that in the scripture. So this makes this very important when God says, you can't make covenant with me and make covenant with the devil. When we receive in our mind right here, and Satan does have a ministry. I think we discussed this tonight. It's hell. But he comes to tell us to speak to our flesh to come alive. Come alive, pride. Come alive, deceit. Come alive, murder, anger, deceit. Come alive. And when we get in agreement with this, what's set up here? See, we're supposed to shut it off. That's how you resist the devil. That's how you're supposed to take every thought captive. And when we let this go to our heart and we get in agreement with the devil in our heart, we are making covenant with him. And then when you get in agreement with the devil in your heart, you'll know by a person's fruit, like Jesus saw the, talked about the Pharisees in John 8, your father and my father are different because I can tell by your deeds who your father is. And these are some of the things we're going to get into, but it's a war against the covenant because I want to tell you something, folks. To begin with, we don't know very much. We're not very smart. There's nobody very smart. Just go ahead and decide that. And there's just been a whole bunch of darkness. And there has been a whole bunch of deception, but a beautiful, wonderful, loving God is moving in our lives to lead us into something. That's the people that want to let God be God and let him have all the glory. And he's living, leading us into something called grace to show us, and that's the only thing it can show you. you, you, you uh, deceived people do not know they're deceived. And he's leading us out of the darkness into some marvelous light, and he is the light, and he's the only one that has all the light. So we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, the spiritual, and then when we put him on, and we're going to see how you put him on, you no longer make any provision for the lust of the carton. Now, that's covenant. We die to the flesh, in other words. We put on each other. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He puts on us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Isn't that right? Or the next thing, we exchange belts. In other words, we exchange strengths. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? We can sure give God a lot of strength, can't we? No, what we give God is our weaknesses. And we receive his strength. 
Now you understand that how we just went before the throne of grace, so you don't have to call any man in to do things like this. You know this? All you have to do is repent and have your heart right, and you can go right before the throne of grace and receive these things for yourself. But you can receive strength from the throne. Lord, your word says that I'm strengthened in all power, but your might, just stand on part of the word, and from your throne right now in the name of Jesus, I receive strength. And that's all you do, and you get it. If you're walking in the Spirit of God, that means taking thoughts captive, walking in covenant. Now, you cannot do this. I want you to know this is where grace is perverted. You absolutely can't do this. But when you begin to walk in it and willing to walk in it, then that's when God empowers you to be something you're totally not because walking in the Spirit is a supernatural walk that only God does through you. It's always been all Him. It never was us. It never was us. It's all Him. That's been the problem, us and demons. Us and demons have been running things long enough. So we exchange strength. He takes on my weakness. I take on his strength. And we know in uh, 2 Corinthians 12 that our power, he said, my power is perfected in weakness. But when I'm weak, then I'm strong. All right, the next thing that we do with the Lord Jesus Christ, are you seeing the covenant now that we're making with Jesus as it relates and as it compared with the other covenants through the word? And you know this is a serious thing. We exchange weapons which means we exchange enemies. Our enemies becomes the Lord Jesus Christ, or God, and uh, his enemies become our enemies. And uh, this is why the Lord says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. See, he just leaves us free to go ahead and love our enemies. He'll take care of them. And don't you think that he doesn't take care of them? I, you know, I was thinking, I was sharing this morning over at First Baptist in Merritt Island about going into a motel late at night, and I just, sometimes I just turn it on to look at on this television, and there was this man making a mockery of God. I couldn't, I'm telling you what is the most nauseating thing. He said that he's talking, he had some robe on, talking about the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And his ha, 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 they were falling out around there as this man. And you know something? Let me tell you something. God is not mocked. And what I could actually see, see, this man didn't know what I knew, but I could actually see the diseases. I could just see the enemy and everything, and the Lord saying, sick him. I could see it just coming into him, not, not literally, but I, but I knew that and not only him, but his whole household. Now, that's the way God operates. And then you'll see him the next day, ha, 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 and probably another week from now, you'll see him, ha, 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 and, oh, isn't he funny? But then you'll notice something. You, God, God has, you know, one of his uh, things about God is patient and long suffering. You'll start seeing a deterioration of his features and his personality and his home and children and the whole bunch. So when it's ha, ha, ha today, I'm telling you what, it won't be ha, ha, ha tomorrow. Because God all over this world is having judgment, and I'll remind you of not one power of darkness, including Satan himself. Uh, uh, God toys with Satan like he would a bird. This whole world is like a speck of dust on the scale or a drop of water in the bucket. That's what Isaiah 40 says about this world. You know, we look at it as... God said this world is meaningless and less than meaningless. The only thing that matters to God is righteousness. That everything be right in God's eyes. So when you think... When you ever think about the power of Satan, you just remember that he's got a little power on the speck. because that's how this world is in the dominion of God. And I want you to also remember that he's calling us, this world just being a speck, he's calling us to be adopted sons. Is that strong? And he's telling us how to get there unless you've got some other way worked out. So we 
exchange strengths. And then we exchange weapons. He takes on our enemies when, see, we are free to love them. We put on the word, and this is reality. This is covenant. All the weapons, you understand that all the weapons that Jesus has, everything at the disposal of the Lord Jesus Christ are at our disposal right now in the name of Jesus. Can you receive that? But see, if the enemy is prevailing to keep people from knowing who they are and keep them blinded to covenant, what do you think he meant when he said over in Hebrews that he said that uh, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would sit at his right hand until he's waiting. Now there's the first word, he's waiting. He's waiting. He's going to have him waiting right here at his right hand until, until. He's going to still just keep waiting there until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. Who are the feet? Who is the body? Who is supposed to bring the powers of darkness under subjection? The only one he's ever given the authority to is the church. The church. The ones in covenant with him. It's already done. They're already defeated. He's telling us to get in on it. Unless you've got something else worked out. We have a lot of other things worked out. Because all of a sudden, we found a lot of things smarter than God. Every wind and doctrine. Or as James Robinson said, if every bray and donkey that comes to town, people follow after it. Now let's just go ahead and agree with the scripture in Jeremiah 10, 14, that all mankind is stupid and devoid of knowledge. That all wisdom comes from God. And you'll find it in another place there too. He said it twice. He always says important things twice. Now I want to look at putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now oh, it would be good you save yourself a lot of trouble if you wait till I tell you to turn to some of these things because really, I, uh, brother and sister, we don't have time to turn to all the scripture because time I wait for everybody to turn to some of these and some of them I just, I'm just going to quote them. But uh, I'll be telling you where to turn to some. Now, we're going to see how we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Ephesians 6, and we're going to see how you put him on. This is how you put him on, and you better have him put on. You have an enemy, and he is an unseen world that you absolutely is stronger than you, wiser than you, and all this enemy is doing is just killing you. He'll kill you while you sit on the front pew. He can kill you while you're preaching. He destroy you and your family. That's only the kind of enemy that we've been ignoring. Most of the church has at any rate. Or what he's called the church. Ephesians 6, verse 11. By the way, you know, we looked at they pervert doctrines too, don't they? Make people believe lies. Keep them in darkness, deceit. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God. You say put it on. I hope you've got that marked. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand. It didn't say ignore, did it? That you may be able to stand firm against the what? The schemes of the devil. Now I want you to circle scheme because I want you to know that is a daily thing against you. There are schemes against you every day. The schemes of the devil. And you already know what these schemes are. It's to destroy you, deceive you, make you believe a lie. For our struggle, now where it says struggle right there, I want you to write right above that, and I want you to know that's a war. And I want you to write war. For our war is, and I want you to watch all the places it says against right here. If you want to circle it or underline it, I want you to watch this is the unseen world that you're in war with. For our struggle or war is not, there it is, against flesh and blood. Is that clear? It's an unseen world. But here it is again, but against 
the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. How in the name of goodness can you stand against a force like that if you're unwilling to walk in covenant? And I, I don't know where I relate this to you. I've, I've never had a thing where I'm sharing in two places in the same day, so it's hard for me to recall what I've said to you. That's something I'll get used to if I ever do this again. But the enemy works with, against you just like rottenness. It's slow. Just like, and the word, see, a curse is just like a moth eating away. It's a slow deterioration. This is the way the enemy works with everyone to get them to, you know, just to drift like in a boat. You get your head down, you look up, and the boat has drifted. And he drifts you, and he drifts you, and he drifts you, and he drifts you further and further into darkness away from the light. So, this is the unseen world. It didn't say to ignore him. It says stand firm against him. And you cannot stand firm if you do not have all, all, all the weapons of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to see what they are. And he said you would better have all of them on. Now, verse 13, Therefore, once again, he says it. Take up the full armor of God that you may be able to what? It didn't say re ignore, did it? Write that word. Resist in the evil day. You don't have any problem knowing this is evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, you'll have to have on the, uh, all the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand firm. I mean, have it all. And then in verse 14, you, once again, he, didn't, he keeps saying, do not ignore. He keeps saying, stand. Stand firm, therefore, having, now here is your first weapon. Girded, sound like a girdle or a belt that we're talking about, right? Girded your loins with the what? First, you've got to have the truth. That's how you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You first put on his truth. And that's the first weapon you get. And the next one, and having, what is those two words right there? Put on. You have to put them on. Isn't that what we're talking about, putting on? We put on the weapons. If we get them from it, if we receive the weapons of Jesus, we have to put them on, don't we? If Peter and I exchange weapons, I take this weapon, I'm, I'm going to lay them down, I'm going to put them on. So we put on the breastplate of righteousness. Number two is righteousness. And as, in verse 15, and having shod your feet, see that's part of the body, with the preparation of the gospel of peace, you know the gospel. And then the next thing you put in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is all Jesus right here. 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield. And the fourth thing you put on is faith. Now I want you to see what faith does. With which you will be able to distinguish all the what? Flaming missiles of the evil one. Those are those darts of lust, deceit, hate, murder, pride, ego, selfishness, self-centeredness, and on and on and on, which is already in the flesh and supposed to be dead. And they're coming, those missiles say, come alive, flesh, come alive, lust, come alive, pride. And you know what the gospel is, and you know what the word is, and you take every thought captive, and that's how you resist the devil. There is more to it than saying, greater than he that's in me than he that's in the world every six months. It's a continuous war. And it's a continuous war. I'm going to tell you something. It's a beautiful thing. Well, I'm going to tell you that God sits on the throne of grace right now. Right now, he's sitting on the throne of grace. There's nothing in your life that you can't make right with him right now. But I'm going to tell you one of these days, he's going to move over to a throne of judgment, and I do not think it's going to be very long. And folks, it's all over. And I think we're warned in the last days of being caught with the cares of the world and it fall on you like a trap. And I want to tell you something, if we have time to get in, we'll carry this thing right into the last days and this, this beautiful snatching away that people are walking in stubbornness and stiff-necked and resistance to the Word of God are going to find out there's going to be a snatching away. It goes in the wrong direction first. 
and you'll see it in your Bible. And you're going to get real, a lot more interested in what your Bible says after you see this. So these flaming missiles, and then in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. This is a weapon of Jesus. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that's which we used a while ago. And an interesting thing, what happens when we speak this word. You know, like when I was down there in Houston at a seminar, allergies began to attack, attack these people all across the place. Well, see, I don't like to, you know, you can, people, some people have a little freedom and they just want to run right over the top of someone. You know, some people are up the road and some are down the road and we're put here to love and help one another. We don't run over the top. It's not our thermometer that someone has to measure up to. We bring them to Jesus. See, that's the problem today. We want everyone to measure up to where we are or something. But I, but, it, but I know that I could go in at the very beginning and get people set free. Sometimes there's pain and, and ache and things like that they're being attacked with. And sometimes the enemy would just attack the whole bunch this way. Well, usually what I like to do, I like for them to see it in the Word before we ever do it. But I didn't have an opportunity to do down there in Houston and some other places I've been. So I just told everyone with allergies that's having problems and tackling, well, I want you to stand up all across this building. And they stood up all across that building. There was about 175 people that stood up that was being attacked with allergies. You're not supposed to have allergies. Do you understand that? Unless you're rebellious. And so it just led them as a simple prayer. We went to the throne of grace like this Bible says. I first give them a chance to repent of any unforgiveness or off they have against someone. And if they had a problem believing the word of God, just repent of doubting and unbelieving the word. And then we just went before that throne and we just stood in this word and just led them in a prayer and God removed the allergies. I had everyone to hold up their hands. There was one fellow that was sitting over here on the right. I noticed a fellow just kind of race out the door. About four years ago, a fellow who was drunk had run into him, and this fellow had not been able to talk since then. But he could make sounds, and he was going to take speech and try to form his words. He could make the sound, but he couldn't form his words. And during that time, God touched him, and he began talking. And he went out there, hurried the phone to go and tell his wife. And he went out there, he decided he had, couldn't talk to her. He had to call another man over the phone there to tell her that it was him and he's talking. And he walked up to a man, he said, I'm talking. He said, you sure are. <laughs> but see, see, the way we are today, God can't do too much because every time we see him gather, do something, we gather around it and make it an idol. If you get any truth, gather around it. Start a denomination. Make a name for yourself. God's trying to get us in a place where he can be God. So, the next thing we do, we cut the animal. Do you remember? The figure eight, they walk through the pieces like Abraham did. And you know who became the animal, don't you? Who took the place of the animal? The Lord Jesus Christ did, didn't he? And we, you know, this is in uh, Hebrews 10, that Jesus took the place of the animal, and you remember that the veil was torn in half when Jesus died. This veil was torn in half, and this was symbolized his flesh being torn for us, and when his flesh was torn for us, the veil was opened up. That's why we can stand right here in the name of Jesus and enter in right into the Holy of Holies to receive grace. Is that right? Because of him not because of smart folks, not because of anything except Jesus. It's not Jesus plus a sign in the yard. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus. And then we talked about the covenant marks, the striking of the hand as the Bible calls it. When you put your hands together, your wrists together, and the blood will mingle together, and which symbolizes the one becoming one, one blood. Now I want you to, to turn with me to Isaiah 49, please. 
Isaiah 49. And when you get to Isaiah 49, I want you to look at me just a second. Now you remember in Acts 1, as he ascended, Jesus ascended into heaven. You remember they had, uh, he had uh, uh, already gone to Calvary, defeated all the powers of darkness, and then he had this flesh, and all eyes watch him ascend into heaven. Could they see him? Could they see him? Well... Do you remember that they put the hand in his side and also what? There were some covenant marks still on him, wasn't it? Those covenant marks were there. Is that right? Isn't that interesting? The covenant marks are there. Well, did you ever wonder if God's just forgot you? If God ever knows what you're doing? See, let me just tell you about God. He knows he's watching your thoughts right now. That's the most amazing thing. See, he's all, uh, see this will help you under, walk with God when you understand he's always looking at your thoughts and motives. It's not how you appear to someone else. But your thoughts and your motives, he hasn't forgotten you. And I'll tell you what, you might want to put this one on your refrigerator. We're going to run into a lot of refrigerator verses this week. But here it is in verse 49, verse 15. Can a woman forget her nurse? Let's, let's go to 14. Who is Zion a type of? Is that a type of the church? That's correct. But Zion said, the Lord's forsaken me. The Lord, Lord's forgotten us. The Lord has forgotten me, Zion says, a church. All right, in verse 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child? That's what God says. Ed, let me ask you something. Can a woman forget her nursing child? Do you understand? I understand that when a child cries, the, the milk process begins in a mother. She, ca she came up front and told me that today. I never knew that. And he says, can a, can a woman forget her nursing child? And have no compassion of the son of the womb? It's impossible. And these may forget, God says, or Jesus, but I will not forget you. Why? Because I've inscribed you were. Look at me. I've inscribed you in the palms of my hands. And your walls, we know this is in, uh, uh, the walls is in Isaiah 60, 18. Walls are salvation. That's his covenant promises to you. That's what walls is. And my, your, your promises, your our covenant, your salvation are continually before me. Is that strong? Are you liking covenant? He said, a woman with a nursing child may, could forget. I can't, it's impossible for me to forget because I've already spoken my word in covenant to you. It's continually before me the promises that I've made to you to the ones who keep covenant with me. See, grace is where God empowers you to walk in the word and be something you're not. First, you have to be in agreement with it. If you're in unbelief and doubt, you'll never walk there. You remember that when uh, Jack Taylor wrote the book about the Holy Spirit, my goodness, just right, the, the problems and how upset some people come about, you know, there's just certain parts of the Bible, see, it doesn't fit in the structure, see. You know, people that's already got all the light don't like to hear any new things from God. And see, this Holy Spirit is the one that comes to empower. That is the grace to empower you to be something you're totally not. You walk in a supernatural realm. You do obey the Word of God. You do walk. What do you think God said that you take every thought captive? Was he that some kind of exercise or something? He said, no, he put it in his Bible for you to do it, not to analyze it. See, that has been a deception. And we want to analyze, be experts about God's Word, instead of walking in it. All right? 
There would be, the, so that would be the covenant marks. Then there are the blessings and the curses. Now I want you to turn with me back to uh, Deuteronomy, and I'm going to tell you somewhere around 27 to 29, I want to see where I want to start. We're going to look at these blessings and curses because I want you to know. I tell you, I'm going to start in Deuteronomy 29. Now, ever since Exodus, there has been an Israel of God. Do you understand that you, if Jesus Christ is your Lord, not because you're sitting here in a church and a building with a steeple on it, but if Jesus Christ is your Lord, that you are the Israel of God. Do you understand that? There has always been an Israel of God. The Israel of God are the people that's in covenant with God. Amen? Amen. And they're, they're, they're separated people. They're separated from the world. They're separated from the forest. They do not walk, talk, and act like the world. They're a holy people. All right, now he's making covenant with the Israel right here. And I, Deuteronomy 29, verse 10. You stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God. Here they all are. Gathered before God to make covenant. Your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, the alien who is within your camps, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your waters. It sound like the whole bunch is there. They're about coming into covenant with God. In verse 12, that you may what? That's what they're standing there to enter in covenant with the Lord your God and into his what? What is that word? I want you to circle that. When you make covenant with God, you take an oath. A covenant's a covenant. I mean, whether it's an old covenant or a new covenant, a new covenant's better than the old. I'm telling you, a covenant with God, you take an oath. You know, it's not something you pass judgment on. You enter into covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath which the Lord your God is making with you today. Here they all stood. Now I want you to turn back to Deuteronomy 27. They're all standing there before God. They're standing there to make covenant with God. Now you remember that the curses, you speak these awful curses on one another if they did not keep covenant. Amen? And this is what they're doing in the 27th chapter of Deuteronomy. And these people are all agreeing to these curses if they do not keep the, I mean, walk in it. To walk in covenant. And I'm just going to read the last one, verse 26. Cursed, I want you to mark cursed. That means the cursed. The curses are on them. Cursed is the one who does not confirm the words of this law by what? It didn't say analyzing it, did it? By doing them, and all the people shall say what? Amen. They say, so be it. They were in agreement that these curses would be on them if they did not keep covenant. Is that correct? All right, now I want you to understand something that all the next chapter of the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy is first starting out with the blessings, and then starting in 15, the blessings, the first 15 verses are for people who are walking in covenant and stay in covenant. And let me just tell you something, that the curses start after the 15th verse and they're still here all over the church today because they're wise in their own eyes. That'd be kind of interesting to look at, won't it? In 28th chapter, verse 1, I mean a covenant's made to walk in. It's an agreement. God says, I will if you will. To make covenant with God all my hand, not walk in it. Remember that all mankind is stupid and devoid of knowledge. I want you to understand something. That Abraham never did come to God. First, 
God came to Abraham and moved him into a place where he could make covenant with it. I absolutely, honestly to believe right now that this is what God is doing. He's moving us into a place to walk with him. It's grace. Man never goes to God. Forget it. It's always God. That man going to God's religion. God always comes to man. Now, a covenant is made, folks. Don't you get this thing, think I've got works and grace messed up. Because we'll cover this when we get through this covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll cover, cover this walk of salvation in the New Testament scriptures about who's getting the Holy Spirit and about the walking covenant. So don't think I've got this. I'm telling you a covenant's made to walk in, to be a doer of the word. James 1 said that the one that's a hearer instead of a doer deludes himself. He deludes himself. Now, no wonder repentance, we don't hear anything about repentance or righteousness or holiness or discernment or these things. To overcome the world, to overcome the flesh, to overcome the devil. See, if you're not overcoming the world, the flesh, the devil, the world and the flesh and the devil are overcoming you. Now, in verse 1, now I want you to understand everything I'm telling you is good news. When you, I'm going to tell you this, going to understanding going to come in your life. That's totally, totally going to change your life just sitting here, but I'm totally going to change this, this word. I think one of the first things you do, particularly when you get the powers of darkness back in the Bible, you're going to want to see, want to reread your Bible. You find out a lot of things we've been calling one thing's another. In a moment, you're going to find out we've been calling blesses, uh, curses, blessings today. Now, let's look at one. Now, it should be if, if, if. If's a condition. Will you please circle if? If you will diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do... There it is. To, to say be a doer. I want you to circle do. You're supposed to do it. God, it over and over, this word says, I'll do this if you'll do this. I'll do this, you do this. You're being careful to do all, all, all his commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you. And they're going to what? They're going to overtake you if, 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 circle if, if, if you'll obey the Lord your God. Now you remember in John where he said when you've got some light, folks, when God gives you some light, he said you better walk in that light because darkness is right there to what? Overtake you, the darkness is curses. That's them. That is the curses. You, when you've got light, you better walk in it. All right, now. Verse 6. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. You're blessed coming and going. Can't beat that, can you? We're going to get over in a minute where you're cursed coming and going, hanging in there. Verse 7, like the world, the Lord will cause your enemies to rise. Boy, I want you to know there's a bunch of them. Oh, are they a bunch. Don't never go away from here saying that I see a demon behind every bush. I see 50. <laughs> I'll be glad when the church can see them. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and shall flee before you seven ways. Nine, the Lord, here's the covenant people with the Lord. The Lord will what? Establish you. Now that's kind of sounding like 1 Peter 5, doesn't it? Perfecting you and establishing you. He also says, oh, there you're going to suffer. But anyway, the Lord will establish you as a what? Since when is people who are supposed to be in covenant with God not supposed to be a holy people? Where'd that come from? That's somebody else working it out. But the Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. That is covenant. New or old, as he has swore to you, if, 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 if. There's a condition. If you'll keep the commandments of the Lord your God and what? What's that word? You're going to walk in whose ways? His ways. Now, verse 15. Now, I like the way you're answering me back. I, I just know you're reading your Bible when you talk back to me like that. And I appreciate that. Now, in verse 15. 
But it shall come about if, 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 there's a condition, you will not weigh, obey the Lord your God. In other words, you get something else worked out. Maybe a window doctrine comes by, or one of those braying donkeys. And you just figure he just might be smarter than God, see? And it come out, if you will not obey the Lord your God, observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today, then he begins to say the rest of Deuteronomy 28, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Folks, let me tell you what the curses are not over in Africa only. Neither the demons. You know, that once again, we all, we've been told they're all over there. That at least they're across the tracks. <laughs> They wouldn't come around our kind of people, would they? See, it only takes one demon. We remember this. Don't make any big thing out of curse. That's just sinning against God and breaking covenant. It only takes one demon to have ground in your life to be a curse. You just remember that. Because one demon is a curse, whatever he's doing. Give ground he gets in your life. All right, now, in verse 19... Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. And then, now, instead of being blessed coming and going, you're cursed coming and going. And then in verse 20, the Lord will send upon you curses and what? What's that word? Confusion. confusion. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? I want you to just mark confusion. Now, let me just give you an example about life and death in the tongue. And Brother Daddy has dealt with this a long time before I ever knew anything about it. Uh, confusion. And the enemy, see, there is a demon that uh, if God hadn't given you a spirit of fear, a power of love, and it's not, where's the spirit of fear? That is, there is a demon who specialized in fear. There are demons who specialize in attacking different parts of the body, maybe like the eyes, blindness, or deafness, or dumbness. They attack different parts of the body. There are d different demons that attack different parts of the personality. Just like God has fruit of the spirit right here, everything God has, the Satan has the counterfeit of. Love and hate and whatever, you see. Love and selfishness. And he has, the, he, has the, he has the counterfeit of. So in this confusion, the world out there, I want to show you the world in the church. The world out there all confess they're confused, don't they? Say, I'm confused. I'm confused. And a church just walks and talks like that. Let me ask you something. How can you be confused if you have the mind of Christ? See, we walk, talk, and act like the devil. We speak curses on us. We're in agreement with our heart with what the devil's doing instead of what God's Word says. God doesn't bless ignorance. My wife stopped me from saying, God, don't bless ignorance. <laughs> but anyway, if you find anyone is confessing confusion, usually... They've got him. He's living right in there pulling that lever of confusion on them. And they're going around boasting in him. And that, remember Jeremiah 10, 14. All mankind is stupid and devoid of knowledge. All right, now, that's the world without the Lord. All wisdom comes from him. Now the Lord will send upon you curses, confusion, you see this is a curse, and rebuke and all you undertake to do until you're destroyed, until you perish quickly on account of the evil of your what? That's your deeds, your walk right there. Uh, because you have forsaken me. Well, let's just look there at uh, 23. And the heaven which is over your head shall be bronze. And note your prayers won't go through. The earth which is underneath you iron. Look in verse 25. Uh, you, you're cursed on the earth. Your prayers don't get through. In verse 25, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies who shall go out before you. Uh, out. Sh you shall go out one way against them, but you shall flee seven ways before them, and you shall be an example of terror to all the kingdoms of the earth. In other words, instead of the enemy going seven different directions, you'll be going seven different directions. It's whether you're walking in government or not. I heard Jack Taylor say one time in... Uh, Meeting in uh, Fort Worth, he said it only takes one sick, weak, anemic demon to bind up the average church. Why not if they don't believe in them? Why should it be any problem? And now in 27, 
the Lord will smite you with the bulls of Egypt and with what? Oh, tumors. I thought those were blessings. What is doing over here in curses? Huh? Well, I'm sure I'm glad God changed, aren't you? I thought tumors were blessings. And right there, it says there, curses. The Lord will smite you with the boils of Egypt, with tumors, and with scab, with itch, from which you cannot be healed. Now, folks, let me tell you something about understanding. When you have understanding, then you know how to apply the word and the covenant. That's where the Lord is leading us. We had a lady there in the seminar that at the end of it, I didn't even know she's there, but we prayed with her and I didn't know and even until probably she sat down there. That was back before the Lord had changed some things. We kind of deal one on one. It got to be so many people you can't do it. And the Lord worked out another way. But she sat there and she had not found out that she hadn't been able to breathe hardly for six months because of a tumor in her throat. Pitiful. And her husband right here, you could just see, he just loved her with all his heart, and he just got down by this chair right there, and he's just such a humble man. Boy, I knew God. I look at some, things like that, and I can just tell when God's going to do something. Boy, God loves them humble people. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. I saw that humble man and that humble lady that was sitting right there, and you know something? We just began praying for her there. And here, here this, this husband just loved this wife and just knows he's just about to lose his wife. And boy, he just comes humbly before that precious throne of grace. And you know, while we was praying for there, she just give a little jerk and she said, it's gone. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it amazing that God can do things like that? You know, we've developed theology that God can't do anything. He needs us more than we need him. That's why I heard Peter a few years ago, come on down and cooperate us with us, God. You see what we're trying to do for you. 